Hello, my name is James Cross. I'm a graduate of the University of Exeter's Experimental Archaeology Master's Program, and I have a Bachelor's in Classical Archaeology and History from Concordia University in Montreal. The paper I'll be presenting today focuses on the addition of different metals to bronze sculptures in order to obtain lifelike color effects without the addition of paint or patination. This rarely seen technique involves attaching anatomical features to the bronze body of the sculpture so that the natural coloring of the metal contrasts with the bronze and attempts to reflect natural human colorings. The primary features we find added to sculptures are made from copper. The bright red coloring of the metal is a good reflection of human lips and nipples. These features would have been precast and either set into the mold and cast onto as part of the main cast or locked into place afterwards. The late classical Rios warriors have teeth made of silver. The bright white metal is a good alternative, though bone and teeth and ivory teeth are also known to have been used. In Athens, there is a single finger of bronze with an inlaid nail of silver was discovered in the early 20th century. This is notable because Pausanias described a sculpture on the Acropolis which had the exact same feature, and given it's the only known example, it is likely that it was viewed by Pausanias himself. The Termi Boxer, a sculpture depicting a tired and beaten athlete, is notable for its extensive use of copper inlay to highlight his injuries. To represent his greatly wounded body, the cuts covering his face were inlaid with copper. Copper was also splattered over his lap to represent falling blood, and he has a black eye consisting of an inlaid patch of copper alloy, darkened with a high percentage of lead. Rias Warrior A, pictured here, shows the focus classical artists placed on the faces of sculptures. The body has a natural pose and was not highly embellished. In his hands, he once held objects, and his nipples are copper pieces inset into holes made during the initial casting, but aside from that, he is bare. The true artistry in this sculpture lies in the face. His hair would have been darkened with patination, framing the golden yellow face with bright red lips and shining teeth of silver. Unlike his nipples, the lips would have been precast set into the mold, ensuring a strong bond. The gap between the lower lips and the mustache was then occupied by silver teeth attached from within the head and detailed in high relief. On some other heads, this was accomplished with latches and hooks within the hollow cavity of the head. The Termi Boxer, pictured here, is the strongest representation of how the addition of metals could bring realism to sculpture. The copious addition of inlaid copper highlights his injuries and pain. On his face, there are numerous holes made either in the initial casting process or chase later that would have been inlaid with copper to represent blood. Some of the inlays have fallen out over time, but on the right side of his temple, three tendrils of blood still spill forth. Unlike his lips, which were sent into the mold and cast onto, his cuts were hammered into place later. Due to the patina over the sculpture, it's become hard to imagine how he would have looked in his prime. His black eye is visible as a swollen bump beneath his right eye, Darker than the rest of his face due to the addition of lead in the mixture. His hair would have also been darkly patinated too, framing his face and placing the viewer's focus on his brightly colored and pained expression. As a result of recycling, deterioration, and the fact that few sculptures are ever fully recovered, we do not have a good indication of how many bronze sculptures were created in classical antiquity. Ancient writers claimed that many major cities were inhabited by thousands of bronze sculptures. For instance, Pliny the Elder remarked that Rhodes held 3,000 bronze sculptures in the first century common era, and that Athens, Olympia, and Delphi all held similar numbers. Pausanias' travel writings also highlight bronze sculptures he felt were worthy of mention, listing hundreds throughout his travels across Greece. As bronze is easily melted down and reused, it was common for sculptures that had become weather to be recycled into new works. Fragmentary evidence from the Athenian Acropolis in the 4th century before Common Era described 25 sculptures that were scheduled for recycling into new sculptures for the temple. Few Hellenistic bronzes uh, survive, but their style is sometimes preserved in later Roman copies, albeit most are known uh, to be copied in marble, such as the Dying Gaul and the many copies of the Farnese Heracles. While bronze sculptures were patinated, they were not fully covered in a dark patina as one might imagine given how most modern sculptures look. Usually, only a few areas were darkened to highlight specific features. Primarily, this meant hair was darkened as it would contrast well with the face of the sculpture as well as reflect Mediterranean people's coloration. On the equestrian sculpture, the horse and jockey from Artemision, a patina was artificially induced to darken the hooves of the horse and the skin of the African jockey to better reflect reality. The modern look of sculptures, that being naturally patinated over time, was derived from early collectors' biases. As early archaeologists and classicists uncovered bronzes, they liked the ancient look of the corroded metal and sought to replicate it. Some even went as far as to lacquer and varnish new finds to ensure a dark patina. On the other hand, Romans and Greeks would have regularly polished their sculptures with oil to ensure they stayed clean and bright. Through careful maintenance, the bronze could be polished to an almost mirror finish, allowing the viewer to see themselves within the sculpture. 
In academic circles, the true colors of ancient sculptures is well understood, but the public is for the most part unaware as they, what they see in museums and on their streets are nothing but dark brown and green sculptures. The Gods in Color project, run by Vincent Brinkman, has traveled across the world presenting replicas of famous pieces of classical art, colored as they would have appeared in classical antiquity, to try and show the public the true face of art in the past. Primarily, the project focused on painted marble sculptures and friezes, but in recent years they tackled the Termi Box and the two Rias warriors. As far as art is concerned, the recreations are masterpieces which demonstrate the possibilities and shining reality available to classical sculptors. Rather than explore a traditional process of creating a sculpture and performing experiments, the project sought to recreate the feeling and the, the original sculpture would have invoked. For instance, on the Termi Boxer reconstruction, which I cannot show due to copyright, please see the link in the video description, the blood running down his face is painted and inlaid with gems rather than being inlaid in a natural form. The lips were also not precast set in the mold, but rather cast as part of the whole sculpture and treated afterwards. The project's stated goal was not to recreate the methods of construction, but the artistry of the sculptures. But in my experience, this is typical of classics where objects are treated similar to pieces of literature, and their meaning and connections is more important than the actual practicalities of their construction. Shown here are the recreations of the two Rias warriors, warrior A being on the left. The equipment is based on theories the project had about the identity of the two sculptures, and attempts to link them to the myth of Erechtheus, an archaic king of Athens who killed the Thracian king. These embellishments add to the character and narrative of the sculpture, but they are hard to prove archaeologically. The initial aims of my work were to create a small number of cast features which would demonstrate the range of polychrome features found in the archaeological record, and to explore the methods by which they be attached to a bronze body. During the research portion of my work, I found that the methods for attaching features to a bronze sculpture were underexplored. Most books barely mention them beyond a paragraph or two. Eventually, I found some current research in the area specifically focused on the Termi Boxer. Mercury et al. 2018 and Arazi et al. 2019 identified through infrared thermography how added features on sculptures like the Termi Boxer were attached to the main body. Essentially, if the feature were pre-made and placed into a mold, and the main body cast around it, the two parts would be metallurgically fused, such as with the lips of the sculpture. By heating the feature with a light bulb and watching how that heat diffused through the sculpture, the methods of attachment could be identified. For example, if a patch or inlay were simply hammered into place, such as with the boxer's nipples or black eye, there would be a small gap between the two pieces of metal and the heat would not be diffused evenly. Through their test, the team identified how every additional feature on the sculpture was attached to the main body. My goal was to test the creation of these colorful features by performing a series of small-scale casts and then testing the attachment methods, something along the lines of comparing the two methods by recreating both methods for the same feature. For example, creating a set of copper nipples and then having one attached by hammering into place and one set into, into the mold and cast onto. But as I had not done any casting on my own before and I had limited time to, to do the casts, my ambitions were a bit too great. Instead, I ended up trying to cast a number of features, and the project became more about the issues I had with casting and the adaptions I made between the casts. My initial plans were far too complex for what I could accomplish. I wanted to create a series of features that could demonstrate both the colors available with just base metals and the means by which they could be brought into a sculpture. The main pieces would be nipples and lips, as they are the most commonly exam seen examples of polychromy. Ideally, it would also have been good to try and create representations of the bronze body for the features to slot into, so a face in bronze was also planned. Almost as an afterthought, a finger was also sculpted, as it's a simple design and could be useful in demonstrating the point further. Over the series of eight casts, it became clear that there were issues in my approach that needed to be dealt with if I was going to have any success, and solving them became the main goal overall. In preparation for the castings, I first collected copper and tin along with the materials for sculpting and molding. Using clay and beeswax, I sculpted a number of features, though all the clay ones broke when attempting to build the molds around them. A pair of lips were sculpted in beeswax, which was accomplished by heating tools in a sand bath and slowly shaping a block of wax into its final form. A plastic mask was also bulked up with molten beeswax so that the mold could be built around without breaking it. In the upper image, you could see the initial models. All but two, all but the two in beeswax broke before casting could be attempted, though the finger was still usable. The frame of the mold was made with small lengths of wood. The oil-bonded sand used in sand casting sticks tightly together and can be compressed so that it can be built around a model and retain shape during the casting process. Essentially, the model is placed in a frame and sand is layered over top and tamped down until it's firm. The frame is then flipped over and the whole thing covered in talcum powder so that the next layer of sand does not fuse with the previous layer. Once the mold is built and the model is removed, channels are cut into the sand for the molten metal to flow into, along with holes for gases to escape from. 
The final product is a negative space into which metal can be poured, creating a new cup. The main issues with the casting sessions, aside from a lack of experience, stemmed from the tilt furnace. The machine only had an on and off function, rose to about 1400 degrees Celsius, so to measure the internal temperature, an infrared thermometer was needed at regular intervals. As the whole very large crucible tilts on a lever rather than being able to manually lift down and pour it, it presented a number of issues. When tilted, the spout was very high up, so the mold had to be placed on a series of wooden planks so that the metal would be less exposed to the air, and it took a number of tries to get the right height. In the first cast, the mold was too high, and the spout of the crucible hit the ceramic funnel and ruined the pour, while if the mold was too low, metal would cool on the spout and obstruct the rest of the material in the crucible as it poured out. As the crucible is heavy and you have to pour from the side, it's hard to judge how quickly the material was moving. During the cast of a pair of copper lifts, molten copper began to jump out of the ceramic funnel and it took a second to stop the material from pouring out. I believe the air vent was located too close to the spout and the heated air escaping the mold pushed on the molten metal as it poured and caused the material to jump back out of the funnel. Constructing the mold took several tries to get right. If the funnel and channel were not placed close to the edge, the short spout of the crucible would not reach it, and if the channel and gas hole were not oriented well, the metal would not flow properly in the mold and would not travel fully through it. The first piece cast was a pair of copper lips. The rather large channel of vent worked well as the piece was fully formed, but the final appearance was mottled and the gap between the lips was covered. This is in part due to the nature of sand casting. It is hard to compact the sand in small areas, and when the model was removed, the gap was lost in the mold. Additionally, the copper does not flow as easily as bronze, and as it cooled in the sand, it became porous and took on a scarred look. After the issues with copper casting, I decided to skip trying to cast a nipple in copper and instead moved on to bronze. The first attempt at the face ended up in failure, as the amount of metal placed in the furnace was not enough so the nose did not fill up. The second time around, the nose formed almost perfectly, only some light work with a rasp was needed to clean the nose, but the jaw did not form like with the previous cast. I believe this is due to the angle that the model had of the face had to sit in the mold. The jaw was higher than other areas, and the metal flowed into the lower areas in the nose before it reached the jaw. Ironically, the finger turned out to be the best piece cast during the sessions, and it was almost done as an afterthought. On the last day, there was enough time to try one more cast, and I quickly built a new mold while the furnace heated up the last of my materials. The cast went smoothly, and when the finger was pulled from the mold, it had taken on a beautiful color and formed perfectly. The model of the finger was prepared with embellishments in mind. A gap was left below the middle joint so that a band of copper could be wrapped around it similar to the loops of copper found on the termy boxer's fingers that were a part of his boxing gloves. The fingernail bed was made with a depression so that tin could be poured into it simulating the silver nail found on the Acropolis. The depression was drilled into after casting to give the tin more surface area to adhere to, and as tin has a very low melting point, a leftover lump from the casting sessions was melted on a hot plate and carefully poured into the depression. It took a few tries to pour it right, as if it flowed out of the depression, it would pop off and be unusable. After about five attempts, it finally pooled in the center of the nail bed and adhered. The edges were then cleaned with a file to make them flush with the edge of the nail bed, and by constantly handling the finger, the oils on my skin cleaned the surface and revealed the golden yellow, co yellow color of the bronze. The final result was an object that displayed exactly what I was looking for. I could tie it back to archaeological sources, and it revealed the colors possible simply with the addition of metallic features rather than any form of paint or patination. I was not able to reach my initial goals in this project. Primarily, this was due to a lack of time, resources, and skill. Despite this, I was able to gain some insight into the casting process and a deeper appreciation for the technical skills ancient casters possessed. There are many things I would change in future endeavors, such as attempting a proper lost wax bronze cast rather than sand casting, and learning from more skilled artists and bronze casters before attempting my own work. I would also plan on focusing on a single feature in order to fully explore its possibilities, such as expanding on the previously cast finger and creating a full polychrome hand. While bronze sculptures can capture our imagination and are beautiful sights to behold, we have not come close to how the ancients would have felt living in a city alongside thousands of metallic reflections of life. Through recreations like the Gods and Color exhibition and research into public views of ancient sculpture, we can explore the meanings these sculptures would have had. The reason I pursued experimental archaeology was that my classical education completely ignored the work put into producing these sculptures and instead solely focused on discussing the sculpture's style and how it could fit into a narrative. Experimental archaeology can and should be used to build on what we know and work to better understand the people and their skills who were involved in creating these colorful metallic beings.
Thank you for your time and attention.